And the finish in front of you there, and turn over to number 44. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. When you have services like we did this morning, that makes you glad you are a part of the family of God. Don't you? And, and, uh, what a blessing. What a good crowd here tonight. And, and uh, let's just trust in the Lord with all our heart and do what He would bid us to do. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I would wash in the fountain, let's by His blood, join heirs with Jesus as we travel this side. For I'm part of the family, the family of God. You will notice we say brother and sister around here. It's because we're a family and these folks are so dear. When one has a heartache, we all share the tears and rejoice in his victory in this family so dear. I'm a quiet. Oh uh -huh. 
this song has been requested and we're going to sing it. I have decided to follow Jesus. And uh, how many of you would like to have a great Bible school? Raise your hand. Amen. Follow Jesus. How many of you would like to have a great revival? Raise your hand. Follow Jesus. That's the way we have success, is to follow Jesus. It's all about following Him and all about what we can do. I, I, I is not a good thing when you're trying to serve the Lord. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, I was in a, in a meeting one time, and this poor fellow, uh, I, I don't mean to trash somebody, but uh, he said, you know what, I had an idea. He said, we ought to have a missions hall. We all just sit there a minute. What's a mission hall? And he said, that's where we put up pictures of all the places, we, the places we've ever been, all the things we've ever done. And we just sort of sit there. Don't need a mission hall. Because it's not we that are doing it. It's right. the Lord. I have decided to follow Jesus. What's the number, Tim? 305. Let's stand and, and sing this song and, and uh, let's do our best to follow Jesus in everything that we do in the coming month and, and uh, everything will work out just fine if we do that. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Though none go with me, I still will follow. Though none go with me, I still will follow. Though none go with me, I still will follow, no turning back, no turning back. My cross I carry till I see Jesus. My cross I carry till I see Jesus. My cross I carry till I see Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. No turning back. come up at this time to take our evening offering up. And Carl, would you lead us in prayer tonight, please? Our grace.
Thank you all. Beautiful song. By the way, do you like uttermost means? <coughs> Simply means it don't get any better than that. That's, right. That's what uttermost means. It don't get any better than that. Just want to remind us of a couple of things. Uh, we're going to have the Lord's Supper next Sunday night. So, deacons, get your wives prepared. Uh, we will serve the Lord's Supper next Sunday night. I think Kim said we have the bread and the wine, uh, the grape juice downstairs. We'll check and make sure of that. Uh, we will be observing the Lord's Supper next Sunday night. Also, uh, let's don't forget our work day is coming up on June 11th, on Friday. We'll be working from 5 to 8, and then on Saturday we'll be working on the 12th from 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. Trying to get ready for Vacation Bible School and then for the revival the next week. Uh, some of the girls have got a head start. We've already washed the windows downstairs. Looks good. Uh, so uh, thank you all for that. Uh, so with that said, let's get to the Word of God. I like to speak tonight on looking at tragedy in the face with trust in God. Yeah. Following the occurrence of several tragedies and calamities, and <clears throat> including a terrible train wreck with many fatalities, Charles Haddon Spurgeon spoke at Metropolitan Tabernacle and delivered a sermon on Sunday morning, September the 8th, 1861. He preached out of Luke chapter 13 regarding the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices in chapter 13 verse 1 and those 18 upon whom the, the tower of Siloam fell and slew them which was in chapter 13 verse 4. And he took that and he took off. And if I may tonight I just want to read you some of the remarks from the opening of that sermon. Spurgeon said, the year 1861 will have a notoriety among its fellows as the year of calamities. Just as the season when men go forth to reap the fruit of their labors, when the harvest of the earth is ripe and the barns are beginning to burst with the new wheat, death too, the mighty reaper, has come forth to cut down his harvest. Full sheaves have been gathered into his garner the tomb. The terrible have been the subject of very painful feelings. He went on to say we have had not only one incident for every day in the week, but two or three. We have not been simply stunned with the alarming noise of one terrific clash, but another and another and another had followed upon each heels. Like Job's messengers, came one after the other. Till we have needed Job's patience and resolve to get through the dreadful tale of woes. He goes on to say, do not think that this is an age in which God is dealing more hardly with us than of old. Don't think that God's providence, providence has become more lax than it was. There always were sudden deaths and there always will be. Be not therefore cast down with sudden fear, neither be you troubled by these calamities. In closing, he said, only learn to trust him, and thou shalt not be afraid of sudden fear. And he closed the message with Psalm 25, 13. Thy soul shall dwell at ease, and thy seed shall inherit the earth. If I had not have told you the year that that was Preach, you would have thought it would have been this morning. Mm -hmm. We have sudden deaths, we have calamities, we have tragedies, yes. and they come one after another, after another, mm -hmm. after another. That's going to bring me to what I want to preach on. If you would turn in your Bibles to Psalms chapter 11. Psalms chapter 11. This was a time in, in David's life when he was going through a lot of troubles. And Saul's jealousy toward David was at its peak. 
She had already thrown the devil at him at least twice and was trying to kill him. So Psalms chapter 11, verse 1. In the Lord put I my trust. How say ye to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain. For lo, the wicked bend their bow. They make ready their arrow upon the string that they may proudly shoot at the upright in heart. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, his eyelids try the children of men. The Lord tried the righteous, but the wicked in him that loveth violence, his soul hateth. Upon the wicked he shall rain snares, fire and brimstone, and a horrible tempest. This shall be the portion of their cup. For the righteous Lord loveth righteousness, his countenance doth behold the upright. Now, the setting of this psalm is introduced to us in 1 Samuel chapter 18 and verse 7. After David had defeated Goliath, the women, in verse 7, says, the women answered one another as they played and said, Saul has slain his thousands, but David his ten thousands. <laughs> then in verse 8 it says, And Saul was very wroth, and the same displeased him, and he said, They have ascribed unto David ten thousand, and to me they have ascribed the thousands. And what can he have more but the kingdom? And Saul eyed David from that day and forward. Now, if you read 1 Samuel chapter 18 and go on to read 19, 20, 21, and 22, you'll find that David went to the priest, Ahimelech, requesting <laughs> weapons and uh, food, okay? Uh, provisions, if you will. Then we find out that while he was talking to Ahimelech, that one of Saul's men, Doeg, the Edomite, saw them talking. And when David walked off, Doeg the Edomite went to Ahimelech and says, why help ye my enemy? So about that time, Saul comes with his footmen and Saul is so wroth and so bad and so jealous of David that he said to his footmen, he said, slay the priest, everyone that wears the ephod. And his footmen said, no, we will not. They were afraid of that. Mm -hmm. So Saul turns to Doeg, the Edomite, and said to him, turn and fall upon the priest. And Doeg, the Edomite, being the heathen that he was, slew 85 priests that day, including Ahimelech. Now, so this is the setting of Psalms chapter 11. So you can understand why David is so upset. So his so-called friends come to David and they say in, in verse 1, flee as a bird to your mountain. Now, they said, David, we can't fight, so you've got to take flight. They said, David, you, you've got to get out of here. You, 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 we, we can't deal with, with this. And let me just say something here about this little bird. It said, flee as a bird to his mountain. They knew that David knew those caves. If you read that, it goes on to say, go into the caves that you know better than anybody. Nobody's going to find you there. Go to the caves and the mountains. But it says, flee as a bird to the mountain. Now, this word bird does not represent a powerful, strong bird like an eagle. This word bird here represents a little bitty bird that you would see. We've got a favorite place we like to eat at in Banner Elk. It's called the Banner Elk Cafe. And they've got an outdoor porch. And we go there a lot of times for lunch. And we'll sit out there and we'll eat, and those little birds will just they'll fly in there and they'll see a little crumb and they'll get it and they'll 
if somebody takes a step toward them, they fly away. Either fly into a tree or they'll fly up on a railing or, or a little brick wall that they got there. And the reason that they fly away is because they have no ability to retaliate. They cannot defend themselves, okay? They were saying, David, we're, we're in a jam here. We cannot defend ourselves, so flee as a little bird to the mountains and get out of here. So David states his consideration of the situation. Now I want us to see how David answered him. His friends are telling him to leave and departure is recommended to him. David said, look at this. For how say ye to my soul, flee as a bird to the mountain. He says, I can't believe you're telling me to flee. You're supposed to be my friends. Did you not read what I just said? Do you not hear what I just said? Do you not comprehend what I just said? In the Lord put I my trust. David said, I'm trusting in the Lord. I'm not trusting in man. I'm not going to run like a little bird that hops away every time somebody takes a step toward him. I'm putting my trust in the Lord. Mm -hmm. Now, David says, how say you this? He rejects her proposal as unreasonable. And he says, in the Lord put I my trust. Now, David does not get scared when they tell him in verse 3 that the foundation, and that's the priest, by the way, that you're talking about, the foundation has been destroyed because that's what they believed in. They believed in the priest of the Lord, and they were all dead, and they were destroyed. David realizes the damage and the danger, but in verse 2 he said, The wicked bend their bow. They make ready their arrow on the string that they may privately shoot at the upright in heart. What David was saying was this. If you've ever been bow hunting, and I haven't, but I know a little bit about it. They take that bow and they put a foot on it down here and they bend that bow like this so they can string it. So that string will be tight when they put that arrow in there to shoot it. So David said, they bend their bow, okay? But look at this. The wicked bend their bow and they make ready their arrow on the string that they may privately, <coughs> privately shoot at the upright in heart. David said, more or less, he said, basically, they're cowards. He said, they're not going to face me face to face. He said, they're going to lay wait for me somewhere privately secretly, more than likely, in darkness, and they're going to shoot their arrows at the upright in heart, which was David. Okay? So David saw the danger, but he was not afraid. So, they said, David, if the foundation be destroyed, what can we do? They said, David, all the priests have been killed. What are we going to do now? <laughs> David just looks at him. Listen to his answer to him in verse number four. The Lord is, his, is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, his eyelids try the children of men. Listen, no matter how hard your circumstances may get, your tragedies may get, your calamities may get, God is still in his temple. Yes. God is still on his throne. Yes. And he knows what we are going through. I love the song that Mike taught us at Clear Springs in the choir. It says, I know the one. And I know the one who walked on the water. I know the one who conquered the raging sea. But the kicker to that song is the end. But best of all, he knows me. Yes, that's what matters. He knows me. Yes, I love yes. that song. Uh, so David's aware of the danger. 
David is also aware of God's perception. Let me read verses 4 and 5. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold his eyelids cry, the children of men. The Lord tries the righteous, but the wicked and him that loves violence, his soul hateth. Now the words try and try here, they're used here to suggest the ideal of investigation. If you do a word study on them, you'll find that it has to do with metallurgy, working with metal, how they put the metal in there, and it has the idea of testing the metal yep. and working the metal to find the strength of the metal. Okay? So as God is looking on us in our lives, he's testing the strength of our metal. Yes. As God is looking at us in our lives, he is determining what we are made of. That's good. That's good, Pastor. What we are made of. He's determining and testing our metal. Good stuff. Now listen, God sees our problems. God sees everything that we do. God do it before the foundation of the world, so you're not going to surprise him with anything. That's true. But when we are weak, God is strong. <laughs> In our weakness, he shows his strength. And sometimes he has to take this old metal and reinforce it. And build us up. Because we're weak. David knows that God is looking at our hearts. And he knows God's perception of us. I will close with this. David is aware of God's punishment. Look at verse 6. Upon the wicked, he shall rain snares, fire and brimstone, and a horrible tempest. This shall be the portion of their cup. David knew, and we should know, that we don't have to fight this battle by ourselves. Amen. Amen. God is going to settle the matter in the end. Yes, it is God who <clears throat> does the judgment. And he will judge at the end. Verse 7 says, Mike, come on, you would. For the righteous Lord loveth righteousness, his countenance doth behold the upright. God is looking at us with his countenance, with his face. He's seeing us. He's seeing what we are going through. And he simply says, in the Lord put I my trust. I asked Mike to sing a special song. Uh, it's an old song. Everybody here knows it. I was reading a book when Delano Moody was conducting a service, a meeting in Crockton, Massachusetts. And a young man came forward. And he had been experiencing extreme troubles during the meeting. And he, the, Dr. Moody could see him. I don't know if he's a doctor or not. I'm going to call him a doctor. He could see the pain and the agony in the young man's face. And the young man got up and came to the altar that night and he said this, I am not quite sure how, but I'm going to trust and I'm going to obey. Now the man that led the music for 